I'm Madeline. I'm the uh, membership manager at ABNY, um, and we're really excited to have you all here. Um, if you're new to ABNY, um, our policy brief events allow us for the opportunity to dive deep into a policy or a set of policies that directly affect everyday life in New York City. So grant reg regulations are an especially important and relevant topic to delve into right now, as the law is currently regulating New York's roughly one million rent stabilized units expire in June. Um, so thank you RPI for generously hosting us and to Jessica Yeager for leading tonight's event and being an avid supporter and role model for APNE. Um, before we get started, I just want to give you a little bit of background on our speaker. Jessica was a, uh, previously the executive director of the NYU Furman Center, uh, which is a leading policy research center focused on affordable housing. While at the Furman Center, she worked on numerous research projects related to affordable housing, land use, and urban policy. Um, she is currently the Vice President in policy, of Policy and Planning at Women in Need, the largest provider of family shelters in New York City. Um, she leads the, the policy and research evaluation teams there. Um, so we're really excited to hear from her today. Um, just so you guys are aware, we are going to be filming this. Um, and we'll have it up on our YouTube page for you to share and see you later. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to Jessica. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks to Abby for inviting me here to talk about rent stabilization. Um, so I'm going to present, um, oh, I, first of all, I want to, before I start on rent stabilization, I also brought a couple of copies of a report that my current organization, WIN, put out last week. Um, which is addressing um, you know, family homelessness and presenting a number of reforms that we think will make the um, help address the need for um, both uh, shelter and permanent housing for homeless families in New York City. So I brought a few copies of those tonight, here, and they're, they're up here if folks are interested. But as Madeline said, um, I used to work at the NYU Furman Center, and when I was at the Furman Center, I did a fair bit of work on rent stabilization, and that's what we're here to talk about tonight. So I'm going to present some slides with some information provide some information, um, give some over an overview of um, the, I'm going to just try to speak loudly, if anyone can't hear me, let me know, um, but provide an overview of the rent stabilization system, some data about what we know about the rent stabilized stock in New York City, and um, then provides a, sort of a brief overview of some of the reforms that are currently pending in Albany right now. Um, and then I hope we can have a conversation um, about, about the rent laws and uh, what, the, what uh, is in store in the coming couple of months as their future is being debated. So I know there are folks in the audience who know a lot more about this topic than I do, so I really look forward to that conversation. The work that I've done on rent stabilization that happened while I was at the Furman Center, this presentation, I sort of cobbled together a few different pieces of work that I did while I was there. So thank you to the Furman Center for letting me uh, use their data. So rent stabilization set of state laws that regulate a subset of rental units in New York City and in a few other jurisdictions in the state. There are two different ways that units become subject to rent stabilization. First, units are subject to rent stabilization if they are buildings with six or more units that were built before 1974. The second way that units become sub subject to rent stabilization is that the owner voluntarily chooses to participate in a subsidy program and one of the conditions of that program is that they have to register the units into rent stabilization. So that's what I will refer to a couple of times in the presentation as voluntary um, stabilization. I just also want to take a moment to talk about another type of re rent regulation that exists in New York, which is rent control, which of course is a term I'm sure that everyone's heard. Um, I'm not going to talk much about rent control because it only applies to a small number of units at this point, but just so you know, rent control is a stricter form of restriction. Um, and it applies to buildings that were built before February of 1947. And it, it applies only to those tenants in those buildings who have lived in, the, in their units continuously since July 1st, 1971. So the two primary protections that rent stabilization provides to tenants are limits on rent increases and then the right to renew your lease. So first, restricted rent increases. Each year, the Rent Guidelines Board sets the rent increase permitted for a lease renewal. Owners can only raise the rent on a unit above that amount um, based on three grounds. The first is upon vacancy. When a unit's vacant, the landlord is permitted to increase the rent for the new tenant by about 20%. The second two categories are major capital improvements, MCIs, and individual apartment improvements, IAIs. When a landlord makes certain apartment improvements or building improvements, they can raise the rent based on how much money they spent for that improvement. 
that is all defined. How much they can raise their rent and what types of improvements qualify is all defined in the law. The second major protection, of course, that rent stabilization provides um, is the right to renew your lease. A landlord is only allowed to refuse to renew a lease in a rent stabilized unit for a limited set of reasons that, again, are delimited in the law. Rent stabilized units are subject to rent stabilization until they aren't anymore. And the way that rent stabilization ends, or the way that units come out of rent stabilization, depends on the reason why the units are stabilized in the first place. So for what I call involuntarily stabilized units, which are those units that were are stabilized by because they're in buildings that were built before 1974, most units become deregulated because they reach the deregulation rent threshold, which was 2733 in 2018, which is this information on the slide, but it, the number's gone up. I'm sorry, the slide wasn't updated. Um, as of 2019, the deregulation threshold was $2,774.76. Once a unit reaches this threshold and the existing tenant moves out, the unit becomes deregulated. This is called high rent vacancy deregulation, or if the threshold is met and the tenant in place makes more than $200,000 for two consecutive years, the unit can be deregulated during that tenant's tenancy. And this is called high rent, high income deregulation. Units can also come out of stabilization through conversion to co-ops, condos, or commercial space, or if there's substantial rehabilitation or demolition in the building. For units that are stabilized because of receipt of a subsidy, they remain subject to rent stabilization regardless of the rent that's charged in the unit until a date that's set either by their regulatory agreement or by the terms of their subsidy program. But typically, unless the landlord notified the tenant in their lease and in every subsequent renewal, when the agreement expires, that tenant who's in place is protected. So the landlord can only deregulate the unit once that tenant moves out. Another important concept as we think about rent stabilization is the distinction between the legal rent and the preferential, and a preferential rent. So a legal rent is the highest rent that the landlord is permitted to charge pursuant to the rent stabilization rules. And that's going to be based on the history of the apartment. It's going to be based on the rent guidelines board increases, any um, MCIs or IEIs that a, a landlord has taken over the years and any vacancy allowances that the landlord has taken. It's the legal rent that's technically recorded with the state. Uh, um, and the, the legal rent, though, can sometimes differ from the amount that the, t the t landlord actually charges for a unit. When a landlord charges less than the legal rent, that's called a preferential rent. And a landlord might choose to do that because it could be that the legal rent is higher than what the market will bear in a particular neighborhood, or they might, it could be that the landlord is just choosing to give a tenant a break for some reason. But that's an important distinction in, in the rules. Um, as of 2014, 28% of units registered as stabilized were charging preferential rents. At any lease renewal under the current rules, a landlord can raise the rent from the preferential rent to the legal rent. Or, at any, or in any amount in between those two things. So the restriction on rent increases that I talked about earlier as being you know, a core piece of the protections that rent stabilization provides, that only applies to <coughs> the increases in the legal rent. Increases in preferential rent can be as big as, they, as they, the landlord wants them to be going up to the legal rent. So next I'm gonna turn to a few facts um, about the rent stabilized stock. Close to half of the rental units in New York City are rent stabilized. In 2017, there were over 960,000 rent-stabilized units in the city. Most units are subject to rent stabilization because they are in buildings built before 1974 and have six or more units. About 857,000 units fall into this category in 2017, and that's about 91% of the rent-stabilized stock. A much smaller number of units are stabilized because they're participated in, participating in an affordable housing subsidy program. Since 2011, the number of rent-stabilized units in the city has stayed relatively constant. But the share of units that are stabilized as a result of participating in a subsidy program has increased. As I noted, those units remain stabilized even if they exceed the deregulation rent threshold. And under the old version of 421A, which is the city's property tax exemption, market rate units in mixed income buildings became rent-stabilized even if their rents were above the deregulation threshold. Since 1994, there has been a net loss of about 148,000 rent-stabilized units in New York City. 
High rent vacancy deregulation is the primary cause of losses to the stock, followed by units converting to co-ops and condos. The largest source of additions to the stabilized stock is the 421A tax exemption program. The additions because of 421A significantly outnumber the losses due to 421A um, expirations. The median income of tenants living in rent stabilized units is lower than the median income of tenants living in market rate units. And in recent years, the incomes of rent stabilized tenants have grown more slowly than the incomes of market rate tenants. At the same time, the median rent in rent stabilized units has also risen, though not as much as the median rent for market rate units. So in short, rent stabilized units are serving, on the whole, tenants with lower incomes, and the rents are also tend to be lower in, in these units. So this is a graph that shows the distribution of rent stabil stabilized units across different rent levels. The black line on the graph is showing the deregulation threshold. Just over half of units that were stabilized in 2017 rented between, for rent between $1,000 and $1,600 a month. Over 13% of stabilized units were renting between $1,900 and $2,700 a month, the deregulation threshold. And about 5%, or 46,000 units, had rents that exceeded the deregulation threshold in 2018. Um, which was just above $2,700 at that time. These units remain rent stabilized because they're, it's required by their subsidy program. And finally, I'm just going to show a couple of maps to show you where in the city we have high concentrations of stabilized units. As of 2017, there were 13 neighborhoods in the city where the majority of rental units were rent stabilized. There are four in the Bronx, two in Manhattan, four in Brooklyn, three in Queens, and none in Staten Island. This map divides the city's neighborhood into categories based on their share of rent stabilized units. The low category, which is the lightest blue, includes the neighborhoods in the bottom quarter in terms of the share of units that are stabilized. Middle are the middle 50% of neighborhoods, and high, the darkest blue, is the top quarter of neighborhoods in terms of the share of units in those neighborhoods that are stabilized. Staten Island and Queens, areas of the city with fewer rental buildings, have smaller shares of rent stabilized units. Manhattan, Brooklyn, and the Bronx have more multifamily apartment buildings and therefore not surprisingly have higher shares of rent stabilized units. So with that background, I'm going to turn to some of the pending reforms. Um, so on June 15th, uh, 2019, this year, the rent laws are set to expire. And as Albany debates their renewal, there are a number of reforms that have gained traction and I'm going to just talk about a few of them here tonight. The first reform that I'm going to talk about um, relates to the vacancy allowance. So as I mentioned, the vacancy allowance is the amount that the legal rent for a subsidized, for a stabilized unit can increase for a new tenant. How it works today is that upon vacancy, an owner can increase the legal rent by about 20%. But there are a few exceptions to that rule. Most notably, as of 2015, the vacancy allowance will be less than this if the prior rent was a preferential rent and the prior tenant moved out less than four years ago. So there's a pending proposal in the Senate and the Assembly to eliminate the vacancy allowance. Based on 2017 data and on the 2018 decontrol threshold, we calculated that with two vacancy allowances, there are about 124 units that are currently stabilized that will exceed the deregulation threshold. And there are about 42,000 stabilized units that are one vacancy allowance away from deregulation. So the next proposal relates to high rent vacancy decontrol. As I mentioned earlier, this is the mechanism by which stabilized units are most likely to come out of um, rent stabilization. Once the legal rent in a stabilized unit reaches the deregulation threshold and the existing tenant moves out, that unit is no longer subject to rent stabilization. There are bills pending in the Senate and the Assembly to eliminate this form of deregulation. A third reform uh, relates to major capital improvements. Um, as, as I explained earlier, after making qualified building improvements, an owner can apply to the state's housing agency, HCR, to increase the rent based on the cost that they spent for that improvement. If HCR approves the MCI, the rent can be increased by an amount equal to the cost of the improvement divided by either 96 months or 108 months, depending on the size of the building. And there are bills pending in the Senate and Assembly both to eliminate MCIs. There are also bills pending to eliminate IAIs, which are the individual apartment improvements that I mentioned before. IAIs are um, increases that an owner can take after making an improvement to a specific apartment. Unlike MCIs, there is no application process for IAIs. They are basically on the honor system. If a unit is occupied, the owner must get the tenant's permission 
to do an IEI, but this rarely happens anecdotally. What, what we understand is that owners typically wait until a unit is vacant when they're allowed to um, do IEIs without getting anyone's permission ahead of time, and then they just need to notify the new tenant who moves in that the IAI is one of the justifications for the current rent. There's also a proposal to address preferential rent, which I explained earlier. So the preferential rent is the amount that an owner charges that's anything less than the legal rent. As I also explained, a landlord um, with any lease renewal, as the law stands now, can increase the preferential rent up to the legal rent. Um, there's a bill pen there are bills pending in the Senate and the Assembly that would only permit increases from a preferential to a legal rent upon a vacancy. So the existing tenant would get the benefit of the preferential rent as long as they stay in the apartment. Um, and then there are a few other proposals I'm going to go into in a little less detail, but of course we can talk about them in the discussion if folks are interested. So one um, proposal is uh, to extend the rent laws to the entire state um, so that any jurisdiction that has um, a housing emergency, which is defined as having a vacancy, a rental vacancy rate that's less than 5%, could choose to opt in to rent stabilization. That's how, well, that's how the same standard that currently exists now, except that only New York City and then jurisdictions in Rockland, Nassau, and Westchester County have the ability to opt into rent stabilization. Another pending proposal would pass statewide good cause eviction requirements. That would mean that for every tenant in the state, the, a landlord could only um, evict or refuse to renew a lease um, if they met the good cause standard, which is defined in the statute. So that's basically a protection that exists now for rent-stabilized tenants, but this law would expand that to all tenants. Another um, proposal that is pending would reform the um, four-year look-back rule. So under the current system, a tenant has four years, of basically a four-year statute of limitations, for lack of a better term, to, to bring a challenge to um, anything that they think was done wrong by their landlord in calculating their rent. Um, but given that the system largely relies on tenants to bring the, to find, to sort of unearth those problems and bring that, that, that claim to the state agency, um, a lot of, you know, many people believe that there's a lot, there are a lot of mistakes and possibly fraud that's going on that's undetected and unchallenged because it takes longer than four years sometimes for tenants to find out that there was a mistake made in the past. So this bill would reform that system by extending um, the amount of time that a, a tenant has to bring a, a complaint or a, a challenge to um, the state's housing agency um, to six years um, and would also have some exceptions to allow for even you know, longer times in certain circumstances. And then the last bill um, that I want to mention here is actually is something that I'm working on at, at my new job as well, um, relates to a, a loophole in the law that allows units that are being rented by nonprofits who provide supportive housing. So supportive housing is a form of affordable housing um, where social services are also provided. And the way that so supportive housing is provided in um, the city currently is that um, typically a nonprofit agency rents units and then has tenants who need those services, basically as subtenants. Um, and right now, as the, when the units are rented by the nonprofit under the current law, they come out of rent stabilization for as long as that nonprofit is renting the unit. And what that means is that the landlord, um, that, that there's no tenant protections. The regular tenant protections that would have existed for a tenant in that unit don't apply. Um, so even though there's that nonprofit that's providing services, a landlord can still, you know, choose to not renew someone's lease or to evict the tenant, and that tenant then doesn't have any of the protections that they would otherwise have. And so this law would make it so that rent stabilization continues to stay in effect even when the unit is being rented by a nonprofit to provide supportive housing services. Um, it would also extend the protections to the tenant in the unit even though that tenant's name is not on the lease. Um, so that is my overview. Um, so that's, that's the overview of both, um, you know, some, some of the facts we know about the rent-stabilized stock in the city and some of the proposals that are pending out there, and I'm happy to uh, answer any questions and also have a conversation.